very cool. Alrighty, let's rock and roll with this. So this is what I'm going to share with you every day, how I stay on purpose, because you can get a bit distracted. Who's got a life? I've got a few kids, and I've got two of mine, and I've got two stepchildren as well. And uh, I also, because I've got kids, I know that it's really tough to stay focused on this steel stuff. So I bought some, I bought some sweeteners up. So real chocolate, real chocolate. I know by day 30, or certainly by day 27 or 8, you're missing some good Australian chocolate. <laughs> so I bought some favourites. But, <laughs> but you have to earn them. <laughs> There's a catch. <laughs> There's a catch. And uh, it's really about coming up with something that's really sharing that you would like to... Um, share with a group as well as uh, as well as a question you get, get a chocolate just for asking a question Tim how about that <laughs> so this is a big thing I wanted to share with you how every day when I get up I'm on purpose and if you stay focused like you have been here this is my energy space today this is when you you've been going to your ballets in the morning and well I do the same I get up and I actually set my day up so this day is a it is a blaze day or this day is a steel day so I don't have to switch from energy to energy and I know you've covered some of these types of things the energy but I'm going to actually share with you the implementation of that and how it actually works in real life with everything else that comes in in our busyness because we're all busy so I found out about wealth dynamics in 2008 I was running a business coaching and consulting business and I went to an event and saw Roger up on stage and thought, ah, oh, this guy's got some pretty cool profiling stuff. And I uh, went and spoke to someone down the back of the room and said, I'd like to become a reseller and actually buy tokens so that I could get my clients to do them so that I could understand how they operate better. And from there, I started getting connected in a bit more with understanding more about the tools. I started presenting on it to groups, you know, and sharing what I learned. And also, my clients started recruiting based on the profiling, and we started um, selling them off our website, and it just took off. And from there, there was this real interest in, well, for me as a Lord profile, uh, when I was working with star profiles, I would be like, I'm just trying to focus. I'm just trying to get through this document. I'm just trying to look at this spreadsheet. And they just want to come in and be all fuzzy and happy and talking, and I'd be like, can you just give me some space? <laughs> So for me, it was really shifted me from getting that annoyance to getting that acknowledgement. And it was as, as, as black and white as that. I got that I needed the stars and the supporters and the deal makers in my team more than I thought that I didn't need them. So the shift I had was the leverage. And you talk about being all the things in your business. Sure, we can all be all the things that we have to be, but we don't want to be all the things. And when I started connecting with people that were star profiles and I sent them out doing the networking, John Abbott and I toured Australia in November last year running a conference called the Bizpreneur for business owners and it was about exactly this. It's understanding there's a lord and a star and we had a deal maker with us as well and we went around, Paul Dunn was on our stage as well. So we had these totally different energies saying the same things from different angles and everyone's going, I've got it. So for me it was getting the leverage from this which was what able, enabled me to step out of my businesses, create new ones and have fun along the way and really love doing what I do. So this is just a little bit of a, the steel numbers. So in a week, we've got 168 hours. We have, say, 50 hours to sleep, 7 hours for showering, that's provided we do 2 showers a day, and 14 hours to eat. Five hours if we travel to and from work. Who travels to and from work? Anyone? Yeah. Uh, and 14 hours to do things like haircuts, doctors, paying bills. And that's if we do a 40-hour work week. We have 38 hours left to spend with our family, friends, or hobbies. Well, who lives their life like that? <laughs> who works more than 40 hours in their businesses? So this is a big thing. It's not You're not going to find the time. It's there already. It's what you're going to take away from to actually shift, start saying no and stop doing something to enable you to have the free time as well. But understanding that there's plenty of time there is a first step because what happens from the 40 hours a week, we can work eight hours productively 
and then we get controlled by our environment, the, the other pa people's problems, and we actually go into their priorities and not our priorities. We start looking after their timelines and their needs and their commitments instead of focusing on our own. And I do love this. <laughs> so if you've got a head that looks like this and a, and a, and a time management plan, um, this is that mind map on time management uh, which I, I had to put in here because for a lot of people this is how your week can look. It's just nuts. And if you're feeling overwhelmed, if anyone ever felt overwhelmed in their time and how they're going to get through this stuff, this is where you're at. It's just like all out there and you've got no idea what you're going to focus on first, what you should be focusing on. Everything feels like it's a priority. And I'm not going to talk to you about time management. I'm going to talk to you about putting into place a flow that enables you to have that freedom to be able to get on with the priorities that are absolutely in front of you. So... This is where I started from. So from my Lord Steely profile, I created this living, working week. And I absolutely focused this. So this is one part of it, and I'm going to share with you Roger's one as well. So you get to see the creator style, and you get to see the, the Lord style. But basically, mine is Monday to Sunday. And as you can see on a Sunday, there's nothing here. It's, it's really enabling some free space. But every morning I exercise. So I either go to a trainer, or I go to the gym, or I go for a walk. But every day, except for Sunday, I have my, my energy space. So that's my time by myself, unless I'm with my personal trainer. And if I'm with my personal trainer, I'll have time on my own before I get to the personal trainer. Then I always make sure I put into place space for lunches and also returning phone calls. Right now, and I'm sure you have as well, we've got our phones off. Mine's off. It's sitting under the desk. And if anyone rings, they can't, I, I'm not going, oh, I've got to answer this call and interrupt talking to you. This is your time. This is where my 100% focus is. Well, I don't look at this situation any different than if I was sitting there on the computer doing my emails or typing a letter or looking at my spreadsheet or on a phone. I don't have my uh, mobile phone where I can see it. You don't need to have it. Bring it back in when you've got an emergency, like if there's an emergency, it's different. But bring it back in when you've got that break at the end of that session like I will, I'll check my mobile phone when we finish today and I'll ring back the people that are urgent. But what tends to happen when other people get how you run your life and timelines, they actually get that you're not available 24-7 and they shift their priorities and expectations as well. But this is how I put it into my actual calendar. So this was an Outlook calendar that I was using, but I'm using Gmail now. And I literally allowed, every Monday morning was my planning session and then... I'm a morning person. Who's a morning person? Who's an afternoon, evening? Not sure. When do you feel the most energized, Tim? Yeah. When do you feel like doing your most work, creative work? Yep. So any time. So when do you feel like you've got your highest level of energy? Do you get a chocolate? Mid morning. Mid morning. I'm sure now. <laughs> There's a bit of dithering going on there. <laughs> You've got to share them around now. So I'm not getting them back out of there. <laughs> yeah. So this is how I scheduled mine. Now the other thing is keeping into place these spaces. Because what happens is situations come up, life comes up, other people's problems do come up that you do have to shift to. Um, and you have to have time or ability to be able to move it. But what is really important here is I put into place all my personal stuff in here too. So if my daughter needs to go to the doctors or the dentist, it's in here. If I need to go and get my hair cut, it's in here. So everything I don't have one diary for the family or one diary for my, my, my personal life or one diary for it's all in one. And this is Rogers. <laughs> As you can see, he's actually written it up from uh, the backgrounds the same here. So I actually took this photo of one that he'd created at one of the programs we're at. So literally, met metal's on a Monday, water's on a Tuesday, wood's on a Wednesday, Thursday's fire, and as, um, the when's on a Friday. So we have our finance meetings on a Monday at 10 o'clock. So today, I can't do that. You've got to have some flexibility. So we're making it Wednesday at 10 o'clock. So there's always the ability to have a slight shift and that's the important thing about this is making sure that 
when you are prioritising or you are allowing all of this, that you've got that bit of flexibility in there as well. Don't beat yourself up. It's like when you go on a diet. You know, you you eat some, something you shouldn't <laughs> shouldn't do that when I give you chocolate, or you have a can of coke or something. Well, you get back on it the next day. It's like when you you know you you set up good intentions. Don't throw it all out with the bathwater. You just uh, you just go through and say, well, tomorrow I'm back on track. So Roger has his medal day on a Monday, and he does go into metal energy, and he stays in that space for a period of time to go through all the stuff that we need to, all of our financials. We have our check-in as well, him and I. And then on Wednesday, he meets with the team. So we have our team huddles. And we have the, all of our teams from Singapore, from um, all over the world, UK, um, from US, from Australia. And we all come in on, we use um, Google Hangout. And so we're all there, and it was Roger's birthday a couple of weeks ago while he was in the US, and we all put on party hats, and we had birthday cake virtually, and we, so we, we, it's about connecting in. And nowadays, how you connect in is however it works. So whatever works for you is right. So our team loves seeing each other because we live so far away from each other. We do see each other physically a few times a year, and we get on so well. So it's really important that you look at how you can keep that connection and that energy there as well. And his why, he he's, um, uses his Tuesdays to um, do his drawings and his sketchings. You've seen his uh, journal, yeah? And if you haven't, um, look up Roger Hamilton YouTube and he's got it actually in there. It's pretty amazing. And he uses that day for his spirituality and his connect back in and even creating content as well. So it doesn't have to be overcomplicated. It can be super simple. It's just what works for you. So what I was doing when I was running the business coaching business, I had two days that I'd meet with clients. So I set it up that Monday was my check-in, planning, look at my numbers, make sure I was okay for the week and make sure you know there was. I'd meet with my bookkeeper. So I'd do a similar type of thing of what Roger's doing now without even consciously being aware of it. But Tuesday and Wednesday was my meet with clients and then Thursday was my follow-up. So all the things that they asked me to do and I needed to send them spreadsheets or help them with things, I'd send it back to them on Thursday and I did my marketing or my sit in the office and catch up on emails. But Friday was my connecting day. So I'd have lunch with new clients or I'd, I'd go and um, meet new prospects or I'd go networking. Or So I set it up that I was in that flow and a couple of things come up, practicalities of it. When I get up in the morning, I know what I'm going to wear. I can put into place my wear a suit or I can wear something casual or I can... So I, the, the practicalities of it and by almost physically putting yourself into that outfit it actually can help you actually stay in that state as well and I know for the day that I'm going to be with people so I grab my briefcase I've got all my forms in there I've got everything together so the logistics and the practicality of being able to make sure you're more organized actually flows through off the back of it as well but I do find it's very tough and very hard to go from sitting and meeting with somebody talking to them about coming on board as one of your top five clients that we're going to sign up top five clients we're going to sign up and we you know then going from that to looking at oh somebody hasn't paid us or the marketing guys haven't sent through the, the briefing to because each time you shift from that energy of meeting with someone to that energy of following up the marketing guys to this energy of looking at your bookkeeping you've changed energy and that's what exhausts you so the more you can stay in one energy the more energized you'll be And it's really important that everyone around you is going in the same direction as you. So I've read this great book called um, Good to Great. And it talks about having everybody on the, on, the, on the bus going in the right direction. But it's not everyone on the bus going in the right direction. It's everyone in the right seats on the bus going in the right direction. And everyone knowing and being empowered by the direction we're going in. So who, who here has got other people in their team that they work with? So who have you got, Caroline? And how often would you catch up with them? Uh, weekly. Yeah. So they all come to, I always put into place this five day. And I work on, I work on Roger's thing. So we have two meetings on a Wednesday. Yep. They see all my clients on a Thursday. I do any uh, training with them on a Thursday. So we were already brought into this whole five day. We started implementing it in April and it completely changed business. Mm. It does. Totally changes your business. 
who else works on some type of energy flows? Yeah. Awesome. No, you. Yeah, with your team. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. And how do you connect up with them? Yeah. And how do you do that? Face to face, or? And how do you connect up with your seventy subcontractors? So who else is working on flow days, like already have energy days that they stick with? Yeah? Did you want to use the microphone? Are we using microphones? Sorry. I get a bit. I forget. My mistake. Um, on the Wednesday for me is usually my um, days when I'm doing more admin and team meetings and sort of more steel energies mm -hmm. just because that's the time when I'm not working with clients. The other four days out I'm actually working with clients mm -hmm. um, but I think I need to change some of my flow days. <sighs> and you might find that it doesn't have to be in a set routine. It doesn't have to be a do a what and then a who and then a when and then a how and then a why. It can be actually whatever works for you. I tend to come because my Lord energy comes into the how. So if somebody says to me something that's going in on in their business and I go straight to the how would you fix it, I don't go to the who do you need to fix it, I should go to the how you fix it. So other people might go, what do you need to do so to when, fix it? And this is something that's really cool. When I looked at, I bought a business um, that was a property education business and I bought it at the end of 2000, I bought it July 2008 just as we went into a global financial crisis. And what I did was that season went into our winter season. So, we've got our seasons up there. Oh, yep, over here. So, when the global financial crisis hit, what I did was I looked at how I could, um, as the accumulator, yeah, the Lord and the mechanic, how I could systemize it, how I could break it all down. Instead of being a 12 month property mentoring program, we started running weekend events. We started doing online programs, I started licensing it off, and we still have it running today, all licensed off to people that are still delivering the content and paying me money every month based on what they're delivering. So when your business is going into a different season as well, you need different people in it. So when it comes, when your business and the season or the, or the environment's impacting it, that's a big part of it. But when you're going into a brand new business, so if you're going, if you've just started your business, then you're in that spring mode. It's a new thing. It's new growth. Well, you're going to look at wanting to have the creator around it, the, um, that innovative, and then the person to promote and sell it. And so it's up here in this spring. But as you move down, then you're looking at who do I need to support me, to manage it, to put into place and make sure the systems are still being done. Uh, what are the systems? What's the timing? What's the contracts? What's the agreements we're going to have with our JVs, which is your deal maker? And making sure that you said win-win, that you've got a win-win for everybody and the business as well. But you've got the contracts and the timings right and the agreements are in place. Well, that's all down here. What tends to happen is people have a great idea. They start their business and they're super excited about what it looks like. And they can even sell it because they're super excited about what it is. But then they don't tend to do this stuff down here. <laughs> and they tend to get down into the, the actual... Yeah, the structure of, of what the agreements look like. They don't actually make them so that they're watertight. And so people go off and they take their, their trademarks when they shouldn't. And they don't have into place the protection. But they don't also collect the money, which is down here as well. So that's your bookkeeper, that's your accounts. That's the person that makes sure your age receivables don't get out of hand. And so what tends to happen is we can come down here in our business and in the season of it, and we think the business idea is not any good. But the business idea is potentially still really good. It's just that we haven't done all this other stuff really good. Anyone relate to that? So it's really important to look at not just who in your team is going with you in the right direction, but how your business is flowing in the right direction and where is it at. And that, that's why Roger talks about the spectrum levels. Because when you're going through this, are you, you know, in that red or orange or yellow or green level or blue? 
and it's not just what level you're at, but understanding that what season you're in as well. But for us in Australia, and certainly in Western Australia, we we have come out a lot of the GFC, and we're probably just starting to go into the spring. In America, they're probably still here; they haven't quite come out of their winter. But in in the spring, as it's coming in, so what I did was, as my business was coming out, and the, this particular property education business, I took it and went right. I'm actually going to start adding some new things on, and so I added on business consulting and share trading, and so we made it more. We actually made new parts of the business because more people were wanting new things from it. And we actually brought a creator in as, a, as somebody that was a consultant into the business. So everything we do is measure. And I heard up here that you start things that you've got to look at how it's going and you've got to review all the time, review all the time. That's 100% right. And one of the things that Roger does, what he did with you, sharing, because I, I, I will know that he was there going, no, 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 no. <laughs> you know, it's too complicated, or it's you, it's too you. You know, it's not the main task, or it's not going to create the right cash flow for you. Or, so what he does exactly that with the team. So if one of the team members are going off, you know, trying to overcomplicate something, or trying to overcreate um, different streams of things that they shouldn't be, and over, not keeping it simple, we're able to all check in pretty quick. And he does exactly the same in his own business as what he's done with all of yours. So, I'll share with you our Google Document system. Anyone use Google Docs? Yeah? And how do you use them? You? I have Google Sites set up yep. uh, where I keep all my procedures and manuals and so forth. Yep. Uh, we also have Google Drive, so we're just toying between the two of those. Yep. And then we use Google Docs um, in order to keep everything up to date and be able to share with team members Great. around the place. Yeah, so how many team members did you say you had? Uh, 20. 20. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Have a chocolate. You don't get a sympathy chocolate, stay. Uh, Tim, <laughs> sorry, here we go. I know what I mean. So this is what, um, basically, this is a, um, actually in, in Google, um, in Google Chrome, what it can come up with is the tab that looks like this. And basically, I'm just going to take you through something really simple, but you just literally clicking on Google Drive comes up with a list of all the documents other people have shared with us, or with me personally, and all the things that I've shared with other people. So I'm able to go, okay, we'll just run an event in the US. So I just type in US and it comes up with the US Millionaire Master Plan Project Group. And then I can actually go, okay, well, who am I going to... Oh, I didn't connect into the internet. Anyway. So I can actually um, choose who I'm going to have in here to actually be a part of it as well. So I can actually choose um, who else has access and invite them in. Yeah, so we, what we did is, as you can see by the tabs below, we had down here the partners that we were going to be working with and what the database was. So, yeah, you've got um, Bill Harris here has got 1 million people in his database. Jack Canfield, 250,000. And that's not their complete database. It's just the database that they were willing to send out to, uh, to their, um, their people, our promotion. And then we put in here what their contact details were. We put in here what, where things were at with progress. Um, also, what affiliate links we gave them, when they were sending out, and then when they sent out and how it all went as well. Because everything we do is we track. We track everything. So this is something that I created up. So we said, okay, well, we've got people that want to work with us as affiliates as well. So let's put them in here and we can track how everything's going. So this was to um, have people send out for the free genius test and also to buy the Millionaire Master Plan book. And so we looked at how, and Roger, has he gone through his actual MMP promotion with you? So with the book in the US, one of the things that he, he had a goal at, at, in November last year when we had a team meeting was to have a bestseller, New York Times bestseller, 29th of July um, this year when it got launched. 
we went out there pretty confident but not sure that we were going to be having one and within two weeks it was a New York Times bestseller based on the pre-sales and all this stuff that we'd done leading up to it. He was number six in the, in the top 100. So that's a, that's a huge um, accolade and it was based on him going into a country. No one knew him. Um, well, not many. And he's this guy that's from Indo-Asia and that comes out to the US telling them how to do stuff. Um, no one had ever heard of spectrum tests or genius tests or uh, wealth dynamics profiling and, you know, that wealth get rich quick sort of, uh, yeah, platform that so many people get on. Uh, so he went out there and he said, well, I've got to have something completely different. One is I've got to have a really good network and really good relationship with people that are out there in the market that are credible. Because then if they're the ones that are credible, Jack Canfield is saying, go and listen to Roger Hamilton, he'll already have that credibility transferred. And the second thing, he said, I need people out there that have got great databases. So he spent a bit of time out there networking and connecting up with the right groups. And you talk about, you know, where do you start? Well, you start where you want to finish. So he went into groups like, um, he talks about um, as a 25K club, which is people that are mentored for $25,000 a year. Um, it's at Joe Foley and Joe Foley's club is, they went to Necker Island last year. That was the group that went over there. And so they're pretty well connected. Um, they have pretty good time. Um, he pays for it, but do you think his $25,000 a year investments uh, got into pretty good contacts? And one of the really most powerful things is, is making sure that you're surrounded with people at the level that you want to be going to as well. I always look at how I can not be the fittest person in the room, how I can not be the smartest person in the room, how I can not be the best at marketing or the best at numbers, because then you're constantly and always inspired and always learning. I never feel as though that I'm dumb. I feel as though I'm able to be put into a situation that I can actually ask the right questions. So, as we go down here into, we looked at how we could get out there with some publicity. So these are the people that we went and approached. <laughs> so some were national and some were, um, but some had cover cover um, sorry, coverage that was um, by a TV or radio, and we actually created this massive big brainstorming list, plus we did some research. New York Times Post, Parade, um, Wall Street Journal, France, Forbes magazine, and you know what? Some of these did this. They declined. But we gave it a go. We've asked the question, and you know what? When they first declined, it wasn't a bestseller. So we've gone back again and said, hey, we're now a bestseller. Do you want to have a look at it? That's why it's really cool in your team to make sure you have those different profiles. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I feel like I'm a bit of the, um, you know, the, the, the negative Nancy at times because, you know, it's using my language so that it is effective and it's making sure I'm not being negative. It's been, like, you know, constructive and putting into place some, so, and visually showing people too because I, I get it straight away, but it's been mapping it out for these very visual people as she's showing them a demonst like a demonstrable um, map of what it needs to look like as an end result as well, and then how it can be you know cover the the, the value of the um, that it's profitable and it's all those ticks ticks those boxes as well. But this is how we we do integrate everything through all the different organisations. Is we start off with a big master plan. <laughs> So it is an overriding one. It's like a business plan, but it's got lots of colours, and, and then if you split the business plan into different projects. So the big overriding one is definitely the, the aligned one. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. So what we, yeah, so I'll sh share with you what we've got. So, <coughs> So basically, so one of the things that we've got in here is um, is the um, break. So this is where it starts with. So this is the the business plan with the big hairy goals and the the why's in here and what we're going to do. But the, really, it's around the the plan is. In 2014, we are launching Entrepreneurs Institute into the US. Our plan is to launch our online learning platform, yada, yada. The goal is to make a $10 million promotion that establishes three brands in the US. Roger Hamilton, Millionaire Master Plan, and Entrepreneurs Institute. So what's the purpose of doing this? 
and then what does it look like as far as our revenue goes through and where we're going to get our revenue from. So, and it's really splitting everything into like the different levels and then it's what products we're selling. So this was, we were super clear when we started the year um, what all this looked like and then who was going to own it all as well. So, um, I'll show you the, I'll show you one of the things that we've got. Um, so we use Dropbox as well. So if you're watching how I'm sort of moving my way around here. Um, have you done anything with team charters at all? Okay. Yeah, so this, this is where it gets split into the projects. So basically, um, this one, for example, is a millionaire master plan conference for the US and UK that we're just currently running. So this is one of the projects. So this is what we're going to generate from it. This is what all of our targets are. This is what our monthly milestones and people going into the events are. So we're super clear, but just breaking it down into just literally um, as small as possible as we can. Um, but I'll just go into... <clears throat> So this is our team charter. So this is the one that goes out to um, basically. Um, I do that. I get still bigger. So this is around um, for 2014 our plan. So Roger came up with okay as a team when we met in November. What do we all have to do really well to actually achieve the goal of not the, the best selling book is our lead generator. That's our lead generator into our programs, to our events, into mentoring, into people, you know, making a difference and adding massive value to our clients. But it's a it, it's a book based on being a marketing strategy. So he said, okay, well, what he's going to be responsible for as Roger, as a CEO, is going to be a unique and comprehensive map of wealth creation. So he's going to be the, the marketing genius behind it all, um, providing... Um, genius test, wealth dynamics, wealth spectrum, providing entrepreneurs with the direction they need and when they need it. Siraj, he's our marketing guy and he's in charge of the online learning platform. Um, Simone's in charge of entrepreneur resorts. Shah, she's based in Singapore. She's, in, um, she's looking after our Crystal Circle members and she's Roger's PA. Penny looks after our Millionaire Master Plan events. So. She's um, around an international roundtable of motivated, profitable partners, localised content, conducting events, hosting tours, nurturing vibrant entrepreneur communities in countries around the world. Um, Wendy, she was, uh, and she's just finished with us, but the US contact for the, for the programs we've been running over there. The recognised world leader in entrepreneur education with the number one best-selling book in entrepreneurship, strong media presence. So she was a key person over there with connecting us up with a lot of the right networks. And me, I'm here walking the talk in the use of our content, philosophy and cultural flow with excellence in systems, processes, policies, financial performance and with a fab team leading the way. So, um, you know, in a, in a corporate organisation, you know, my role is general manager. But the reality is, it's not just so much about me being overviewing each of the projects. It's about making sure that everything's super cohesive as well. And that's, yeah, that's what I've been focusing on. Yeah. And then we've gone into each quarter. What does it look like overall? And what does it look like for each project? So everything gets split down into overview, big stuff, and then break it down, break it down, break it down, so that we know what we're doing in January. We know what our outcomes are every month, and then from there, it goes back onto that, um, goes back onto here, so we're able to track that we're on track. Give you a copy of that. Did you start with that million dollar goal? Just work backwards. Yep. So you want the microphone. Um, so what we'd start with is your, you know, five clients at two thousand dollars each, and then thanks, Shane. And then you'd chocolate, Shane. Okay. And then then you go from your five clients at 2000 like, well, who's owning that? What part of that am I going to be responsible for and what part of it is someone else going to be responsible for? What are the bits in it that, um, you know, what does it look like? What does it feel like? What am I going to achieve by the end of January? Am I going to, oh, what is it now? It's September today, first day of spring. Autumn. Autumn. <laughs> 
So today, on the first day of the last month of a quarter three, because July, August, September is a quarter of the year. So for the month of September, what is a milestone I'm going to achieve? Am I going to get someone signed up or am I actually going to just get all the um, communication pathways set up, my emails or my networks or find out where I've got to go or find out who I need to speak to and get them all detailed and get all their contact details. So is that going to be a planning month or is it going to be an outcome-based month? So you know. And, and people go, well, I don't know. I can't just put down a number. I don't know when I'm going to get the five people. But it's putting them down so that you've got something that's what you think. It's your best guess. You know, your estimation guess. It's your guesstimation. And that's what you come up with and that's what you start is your best guess. Roger didn't know he was going to be a millionaire, oh, a millionaire, a millionaire master plan bestseller. He knew that he wanted to have that happen, and there's no one that can make you can't buy it. It's actually, it's New York Times don't even, it's not based on the number of books sold. It's this massive behind the scenes formula that they don't tell anyone. And it's so many books that are bought through airport um, shops that are bought online. There's this matrix that they use that's totally 100% secret. So we couldn't even go, okay, well, we've got to sell so many books online and so many books. We just had to talk to other best-selling authors, try and get an idea of what we think we needed to get numbers on the, on the you know, runs on the board and books sold. And so we just went hard in our belief that we were on the right track and kept checking, reviewing, checking, changing. So I was going to share with you another one that I did, and this is a business that I've got up and running right now. And it started off uh, not in a dirt paddock like it's up here, actually started off as a business idea um, on one of those beautiful warm sunny days, and it was the middle of summer, and some really good friends of ours, another couple, uh, my husband and I, we went out for a boat trip about, I don't know, 8Ks offshore, and we were just off moored off this little island called Karnak Island and we dropped the anchor and the kids were all snorkeling and there were some seals around and we had the esky with a few beers and champagne and, and who's ever come up with an awesome business idea when they've had a few drinks? <laughs> and, and the more we drank, the better the business idea was. And we sat there and it was, you know, as the afternoon progressed and as we got going, this idea was just like, absolutely 100% like the best idea ever and we got back and the next day we woke up and we thought is it still the best business idea ever and you know what sometimes it's not the next day but this one still was and what it was was the couple we were with he has been in the concrete industry all his life <clears throat> he's been general manager estate manager and head sales person for a lot of multinational um, organizations that if you're in Australia, some of them are based out of Germany, so you'd even know some of their names. And so he said, uh, I've got this business plan of actually starting our owner. Now, it was 2009. We'd come out of what was you know, a pretty tough start of the year with a lot of global companies going down. And certainly through Western Australia, what we had was a lot of big mining companies, which was propping up our economy. They slashed their workforce. Some were putting off 5,000 employees overnight. So it was in the news, it was really prominent, it was a bit of doom and gloom and it was, it was definitely a winter period. But what was happening and what a lot of companies do is when they're in financial hardship is they will put off their marketing people and they'll put off the people that do all their design or graphics, they'll put off all the people that business development managers, they'll slash their sales teams. Why? But they do. And what these companies were doing was slashing their services as well. So we looked and started doing our own research and what was happening in, in an area that still had a lot of building going on because we were building new hospitals, we <coughs> were building new airports because all this infrastructure is getting done to still support the platform of the mining community and the, and the state was, is, is very wealthy. So we thought, well, there's a huge amount of work there. There's a lot of companies that are slashing all their team and they're not delivering any service. And these big guys were going and competing with the mining companies. They were all going and slashing prices. And they're going out for the big jobs with very little profit, leaving all the mums and dads, the hospital, the airport, and all the places in Perth that were building that had big profit margins, that we felt that we could come in and set up a concrete plant. 
So this idea that started forming, well, we didn't know anything about concreting other than it's cement and water and a bit of blue metal mixed together. And this other guy knew all about it. He's, he was an industry expert of, of different types of blends, but he didn't know anything about business and he didn't know how to fund it or where to get the funding. Or, and so we went, well, we could do that part of it and we could come in and maybe look at how we could set it up and fund it and put it to the bank. And you could come up with the actual, you know, in-house industry knowledge and the contacts and the, and the product style. So over the next few months, we started putting some energy into this and we put together what we started with was the big, hairy, audacious goal and the business plan. Not really sure of the how at that point, but we certainly started mapping out the how pretty quick, who we needed, when we were going to implement it. Then we had to look at how we're going to do funding because we were going to put a lot of the funding in ourselves, but we're also going to look at how we could outsource some funding too through the banks. And this is at a time in 2009 that the banks were not lending one cent to any new startup businesses or projects, and they weren't certainly weren't spending or investing in anything or giving any money out that didn't have 100% security on it or pre-sales or contracts. So we took to them a business plan that was pretty big, and this business plan was all based on what we believed, what we thought, what our picture was. There was no pre-sales, there was no contracts, because you don't do contracts in the <laughs> in the concreting industry, you sit around, you have lots of red wine, and the guys do, and they're Croatian and Italian, and they've been in the industry for five generations, and they get up and they go, huh, 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 that's it, and they go away, there's like a $2 million deal just been done, or a $20 million deal, there's nothing in writing. So we couldn't take anything to the uh, banking industry, and so we took what we believe was our vision with the how we were going to achieve it. They said it was the best business plan they'd ever seen. And they gave us funding, um, and 40% of the funding was unsecured. So we went back and we put together, uh, we found a hectare of, of land, 100 metres by 100 metres. It cost us a million dollars to, um, to actually do the earthworks on this block of land. And here's my husband, John, and my daughter. Um, this is what it looked like. It's hard to see at this point what it's really going to be doing. But we had so much belief in our numbers and in our plan because we had microed it all out to the bare end of exactly how we're going to make it all work. So John and Paul, the two guys, they went over to China and they went and bought, um, went to one of those big expos and they went shopping for a concrete ready mix plant. And they went, they went and bought one. Um, flat packed it like Ikea furniture, put it into seven sea containers and we shipped it back to Perth. We brought over two engineers from China um, to actually, and they lived um, in one of our little properties for about three months. We, um, they had ate fish and chips for the first time in their lives. And we, uh, yeah, they didn't speak any English. We had to use iPhone translators to uh, communicate. And these guys, we literally built um, a Chinese plant that had everything wired wrong or, or different to what we needed requirements in Australia. And we got to the point that the, we were supposed to be starting business because we thought it would take us probably about 18 months. We'll buy the plant, get it over here, get it built, about six months. Um, earthworks obviously was a few months. And then getting into place all the earthworks and the, the roadworks and the drainage and the things that we needed to do and the compliance. But what happened is we had a really big challenge with the council because they didn't want us to build a concrete plant in what was a light industrial area where we had already started earthworks and all this um, preparation. So it took us seven months to get it through council and we actually had to go to community council meetings and meet with um, you know, little community groups that were concerned about the dust or the runoff. And It was in an industrial park, it's not in a housing area, but they still were worried about the noise. And so then we had to put extra measures in. And then Western Power, something that we thought we'd just ring them and say we need the power on next week, they said it was going to be 11 months. And so we said we, we couldn't afford at that point to survive 11 months. We actually couldn't survive 11 months. So we had put every single thing we had into it. We had put mortgaged everything. We had sold our house and we'd moved into a rental so we could free up all the capital out of there. We had so much belief that this is going to happen that at that point they said it was going to be 12 months away 
and we were going to be a million dollars behind budget and we couldn't get any more out of the bank. In fact, they said the last thing to us was don't come back and ask us for any more money. <laughs> so we, we started looking for JVs and we looked to somebody to come in and actually a private investor. So we had to put up together another lot of investment documents for people that were somebody that would come in over a two year period and just give us a million dollars. We would give them no security. <laughs> <laughs> but we'd give them some pretty good interest and we'd pay them interest through that period of time and that's what that's how we went through so we we opened our doors um, and three years ago so when we bought it back from China we built the um, plant so what happens typically in a concrete plant I didn't know this and I grew up on a farm so I knew a bit about how stuff works but what happens is those little ready mix um, concrete trucks that drive around with the bowls on the back. Well, in the olden days, the guys that are driving them are little Italian guys that have been in the industry for years and years. And so that they can actually get there and add a bit of extra water on side and they put the hose in and they've got this ability to be able to look at it and make an adjustment. Well, we wanted our business to be so much about service that we're actually bringing in something that was a completely different product. And what we did is we didn't have it so that it actually got mixed as it went into the truck and it was really dependent on the ability of the driver. We created and bought this. It's designed to actually be mixed like a cake mix up here. And as it goes into the truck, it's already perfect. So you don't actually have to have a highly skilled driver that's a 60-year-old you know, guy that's in the industry. We could actually bring in some really cool guys that really wanted to be customer focused and service focused. And they were trainable. No, <laughs> having a vowel at the end of the name. Yeah. So, so then we went and we had to paint it because they uh, got a bit scummed in the sea containers, and we had to buy trucks. And we thought, well, what's our colour and branding going to be? And uh, we thought we'd go for the Italian colours because the industry is so focused around Italians. We're not Italians. I love Italians, but uh, they were our clients, and they were people that we were going to be doing business with. So we thought that, that was something that would be a big impact. Well, the guys came up with the name Technically Designed Concrete, TDC, <clears throat> and we couldn't go and buy second-hand trucks, which is what we wanted to, which is a big difference to buying brand new ones. But the bank said, we're not going to lease any funds to you on a second-hand vehicle, which is quite typical for commercial. You have to buy 100% new. So each truck to get it to this point and on the road was 250000 and we've got 16 now, but we started with eleven. So I just wanted to share that with you because, you know, what was sitting on the back of that boat was really awesome idea and as it, we drank more, it sounded better. But the reality is that can happen. And then it's coming back to real reality of, okay, and sobering up saying, is this actually going to work? And not only that is how much am I prepared to commit? And am I prepared to put, you know, my money where my mouth is? And am I prepared to put my heart and soul where that is as well? And at that point, that's taking that step in your business that you really are 100% the reason you're getting up early and you're going to bed late is because you are so passionate and excited and committed to knowing that it's going to work. I'm not passionate about concrete. I'm passionate about the business. It doesn't matter what the business service or product is. I have so many people, clients that I've worked with say, oh, you know, oh, it's just business. You probably, do you think the idea is okay? I go, well, the idea is irrelevant. And it is. The product's irrelevant. So long as it's adding value to somebody or something, it doesn't matter what the product is. So long as you can add value and you can make a profit, your business will be sustainable. So we're adding value. We're making sure that we're a customer service based business that's adding value and we're absolutely making a profit. So we started the business overnight just before Christmas, which was later than what we hoped, and then we had to shut the doors over Christmas. But by the end of March, so for we didn't reopen until the middle of January, because everything shuts down in Perth over Christmas. But at the end of March, we were already running in a profit in our PL. By the end of the first 12 months, not two years, we paid back a million dollars to our private investor <coughs> with interest. And at six months of operation, we had already on the table our first offer of one of our competitors wanted to buy us out because they saw us as a threat. And not only that, it's bloody hard to start a concrete business. No one told us that. And so they wanted to come in and just buy one. And so we then started negotiating with them to buy into our business, which they did, which enabled us to pay back the banks. 
So we're now still uh, owners of the concrete plant, majority owners. Uh, the two boys are general managers, one's operations and one's logistics, uh, sorry, operations and one's sales. And they, run, they work in there absolutely full time, but in July last year, my husband turned 50. <laughs> Hey, Kev. <laughs> Dogs. My God, there's two of them. <laughs> Sorry. Two dogs. Yeah, they're Patrick's kids. So in July last year, we had the ability of stepping out of our business and taking some time out to travel through Europe, uh, go to Croatia, uh, sit on a boat and uh, swim and do nothing for, and check up on our business like I do with General Manager of Entrepreneurs Institute from anywhere. So this morning I was on a Skype call before I came in here. Um, Wednesday we've got our team huddle, I'm doing it from Bali. I'm hopping on a plane here Wednesday night, flying to London and meeting up with our team over there and we're still gonna be still connecting in uh, wherever we are because we've got these really transparent, really super clear, not just setting up the project of what the goal looks like, but all the milestones, all the check-ins, and we're all really open. Things aren't working. It's putting your hand up and saying they're not and looking at how we can work together. So we're going to take a break. We're going to come back at 11 o'clock and I'm going to share with you a little bit more about not just Entrepreneurs Institute but about putting into place a system as well so that you can use that in your business 